Okay, so this is um, the final presentations of the MGA 632 group project uh, module. Um, the group project module uh, of the MSc in Interaction Design course uh, that's offered by the Cyprus University of Technology and Tallinn University in Estonia uh, is an online course. And the group project module is one of the last uh, module students had undertake in this um, two to four year period uh, right alongside their their final thesis. Uh, the students are asked to uh, adjust and uh, utilize a design sprint methodology uh, which is a design thinking method adapt to uh, a way that it will be run online as part of their module for a period of uh, about two and a half months and respond to a, a, a problem or project that's uh, preset for them. Um, so for, for this term, the, the project that was set or the task was uh, for the two groups of students that are undertaking the module to design a system product experience that foster the participation of the public in the decision-making process of urban planning using augmented reality. Uh, so a bit, a bit of a background in terms of the the, the pro project and the the problematic that was set. That urban design and planning worldwide have long been criticized for their lack of meaningful public consultation and participation in the process of the making of our cities. Currently, the existing practices of consultation and participation are within the confines of council meetings, complex form filling and survey reports that most often do not carry little weight towards the decisions made by the planning authorities. Moreover, the way information is disseminated to the public regarding potential developments requires a higher level of knowledge and training in architecture and planning. Therefore, a misinformed public can easily feel threatened by developments, disempowered and excluded from the decision making, especially where private interests are being discussed. In this milieu, uh, the projects uh, that will be presented by the two groups aim to empower both citizens that seek ways to participate in the decision-making process for the design of their cities, as well as neighborhoods and stakeholders that would like to involve the public actively in the process of shaping their environment, therefore creating a lasting and meaningful impact. Uh, we'll begin with the first group that has about 20 minutes to present uh, both their, their process work and their adaptation of the design sprint methodology, but also uh, the process and the outcomes of the solution they, they have developed uh, I, I, along this theme and this problematic. Uh, followed by 20 minutes of feedback from the other group, uh, myself and Professor Zafiris. And then we'll have the other group present and follow the same, same process. Uh, okay, so Chao, if you want to share your screen and present whenever you're ready. Hi, can you hear me well? Yes. So I only have uh, one screen and for, for whatever reason, I can't share a different tab or a different application window of Chrome. So I don't have notes. I only have the, the 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 slides. It's going to be a little bit of a freestyle, I guess. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Uh, okay, is it full screen now? Yes, perfect. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the, the let's start with the challenge. So we are challenged for this group project to uh, solve the problems of uh, participatory urban planning um, with the help of augmented reality and using the methods proposed by uh, Design Sprint uh, by Jake Knapp uh, from Google Ventures. 
and um, first uh, we asked ourselves so um, what's wrong with participatory urban planning uh, so what's the problem with participatory urban planning um, so uh, following the, the the design sprint methods we went to uh, interview um, some experts in this area uh, and we interviewed the town planner and uh, an architect and we found that uh, public participation is very important because government experts don't usually understand people's needs um, bureaucracy makes participation very difficult uh, town planners often use focus groups or community members for for getting feedback and they use posters and physical models for sharing um, the the urban planning urban plans also citizens uh, only know about plans after these plans have been decided and sometimes are already in progress. Um, urban planning is often part of political agenda and not really uh, solving people's needs. And, and people don't know how to engage with, uh, parts, with urban planning, so they can't do participatory urban planning. Um, and um, sometimes there are some organized groups uh, of citizens for example, uh, elders or, or groups of parents uh, or commuters or uh, uh, local residents, they, they, they organize themselves and they ask uh, the town for changes or for fixing something that is for their uh, personal interest. We also did some research uh, other than the, the interviews. We went through some uh, literature um, and for some research studies and we found that traditionally people have to visit the town hall to see what are the urban plans that are in place now and what options are there and um, provide their feedback if they know how to understand those plans and if they know how to provide the feedback. Another thing is that people don't understand these plans. They are too complex or too bulky or too big uh, or they are not, uh, they, they're not relate, they don't relate themselves with these plans. Uh, we also found that technology uh, should help citizens to participate more, for example, with the use of mobile applications. And urban planning uh, is often organized in zones. This is an important concept that we use for, for our application. So now that we know what participatory urban planning is and the problems related with this, we went to find what is augmented reality and how can we leverage uh, augmented reality to, to solve the participatory urban planning uh, issues. So we interviewed uh, uh, AR hobbyist, a uh, developer, uh, and two designers, which happened to be in the team, it was me and Sean. And uh, essentially we found that today there are two major frameworks for building uh, mobile uh, augmented reality applications, and we focused on mobile, because the research that we did pointed on, on that direction. Uh, and there is, so there is Apple uh, AR Kit and there is Google AR Core. Uh, and they provide a lot of um, functionalities or features that we could base ourselves to create our, our solution. So this way we know that we are building something that is technologically feasible. We are not coming up with something that then it's not possible to build because technology doesn't exist or it doesn't work that way. So we use this as an inspiration to, to, to base the foundations of, of, our, of our features. Um, they also provide several examples of real life applications that could inspire uh, or that are somehow related with urban planning. For example, the IKEA place where people can add objects on a physical space or the Pokemon Go uh, where people can find objects on the physical space, uh, both through uh, the camera or through using a map with a GPR location. And for example, the, the street view on Google Maps that you can see the directions on the street and some 3D elements uh, and overlays on um, uh, real view. So now that we understand what the urban planning and participatory urban planning is, uh, and augmented reality, and we have a grasp on these problems and how we can leverage uh, AR to fix this, we came up with a, with a, a long-term goal. 
The goal is to design a mobile application that fosters the participation of the public in the decision-making process of urban planning using augmented reality. Uh, but this goal is very broad and it's subject to, to interpretation. So different people can inter interpret it differently and it covers a lot of problems. Uh, so following the, the, the design sprint uh, methods, uh, there is an exercise uh, where we have to create how my two nodes or basically to narrow down specific problems within this this overarching problem um, and we define exactly the problems that that we would attempt to solve we later grouped them in different uh, teams and then we voted on the most important ones uh, still there are a lot of problems um, so we narrowed down to uh, the most voted ones and they, they were five. So we identified uh, five main uh, problems that uh, we want to, to solve with, with this uh, design sprint. So we want to help citizens to visualize urban plans. We, help, we want to help them to understand the plans. We want to help citizens to also express their thoughts about urban plans to say something about the, 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 these existing plans. And we also want uh, citizens to be able to, to participate by proposing their own solutions or their own plans. And at the same time, we want to make sure that the things that they are proposing are, are feasible. Uh, and we want to improve uh, citizen engagement. So based on uh, those findings and on the main goal, we created this ideal journey map uh, so that uh, the actors or the, the users, uh, the people that we have identified, uh, can achieve their goals via our application, our mobile application. So all the steps that these citizens and also the promoters of these uh, urban plans, uh, all the steps that they need to go uh, from the beginning uh, related within the scope of the app until they actually uh, achieve their goals, which is to um, uh, participate in, in urban planning and also for promoters to get the feedback from, from the citizens. So we, um, we, we did a little bit too much and this started to get a bit overwhelming and the application was getting bigger and bigger and ideas were coming and coming. Um, and it wouldn't be feasible for us to build this whole thing um, with this exercise of this design sprint. So we had to narrow down the, the, the scope uh, of our map and using the, the overarching question and the, on my three notes, we defined two specific use cases. Um, and we focused on only on those use cases and this defined the scope of the prototype and the tests that we are going to do on the following phases. So one, one case is for citizens to provide, to find uh, plans um, and to provide their feedback and engage with those plans um, and, and to share them with, with others. And the other use case is about driving people to propose their own plans and propose their own uh, urban planning ideas. <coughs> okay, so considering these, these scenarios, uh, the team uh, went to find examples uh, in, in the real world examples uh, that somehow cover this topic. Um, and uh, they sh each team member shared the, 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 these examples and we learned about these uh, ideas from all of these examples. We, we pointed the main ideas from each example um, and uh, these ideas we later used them and we remixed them and we adapted them or some of them uh, to our own ideas and to our own projects. Um, eventually we started to do some drawings and we went to the sketching phase uh, and there are two main exercises here one is the crazy aids and crazy aids is, is great for loosening up our minds and for for allowing ourselves individuals to come up with new ideas uh, based on the same on the same 
uh, with the same focus, generating more and more ideas on, on, on that specific focus. Um, and the three-part solution sketch template is also uh, very interesting for, um, well, first, it provides us a, a framework to present our ideas. Sometimes it's difficult to present our ideas, and having a, a fixed framework makes it easier. And it also makes it easier for everybody to read everybody's ideas because they are formatted the same way. So when we put them side by side, you can um, you can compare them side by side, and they are they have the same format. Um, not bragging about our team, but we created a lot of uh, good uh, ideas. Some were concurrent ideas, some would complement each other, and there are a lot of overlapping ideas. Um, and for uh, this exercise, for this design sprint, it would be impossible to consider all of the ideas. Um, so we had to decide which ideas to use. And voting and, and discussing uh, was essential for, for narrowing down this, um, uh, the, the, the best ideas. Um, I have to say that I, I think, I, I think that the team will agree with me, but this uh, exercise was one of the best ones uh, in terms of um, learning about actual ideas that other team members were talking about. Uh, because as we are not co-located, we are remote, uh, communication is limited. And this exercise of discussing these ideas uh, and questioning what are you talking about uh, with, with these ideas that you are suggesting. And uh, the exercise of voting with a limited number of votes where you have to really think where you're going to put your vote because it, it really counts and you don't have uh, so many votes or you, know, you only have so many votes. Uh, this was a very good exercise and it took us some hours to go through the, this exercise. Um, but we, we changed a lot of our, um, a lot of our minds about um, about what we are going to, to do, and specifically about the zones, for example. Up to this, this point, we didn't think zones were that important, uh, but when Sean proposed zones on, on his uh, ideas and he explained to us what zones were, uh, even though we put all our individual votes here and there, we ended up by putting one big vote uh, on the on the zones because we realized well this needs to be uh, included and leave it out even though we never talked about it before <clears throat> and then once we got the uh, ideas nailed down we went to to storyboarding so doing this remotely is very challenging so, so we met remotely um, everybody on his on on, on their uh, country. And one person was uh, sketching. So there is this, this paper. This, this photo is showing the, the um, so it's my, de my desktop. So I was sketching, and I had a piece of paper on the right and the tripod on top of it with a phone. And I was streaming the, the paper to our Hangouts call. Uh, and everybody was on the Hangouts call watching what I was sharing. And everybody was discussing ideas and uh, the, the layout and uh, what labels to put on the buttons and how the interactions would work and going back and forth. And, and I was designing those screens and those changes on, on the fly. And every time we were happy about the screen, uh, another team member would make a screenshot of the, um, so on the screen they would make a screenshot of the, the end state of that design, let's say, uh, and, and he would paste it on the storyboard. In the end, we ended up with, uh, with this storyboard, um, the user journey throughout our mobile application. Uh, also, we considered not only the map, but also this. at this point, we were already thinking about the scenarios that we wanted to test. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we could test the scenarios with this storyboard, uh, or the prototype that we were going to build had to support the scenarios. And, and at this stage, we were already thinking about that. And then we went to the prototyping, to the actual prototyping uh, uh, part. Uh, the first step was to choose which prototyping tool to use. And this was challenging. There are so many prototyping tools. Um, it, it's, and, and they're, they're growing, and there are even there are more tools. And the ones that exist, they are getting more and more, more complex and more advanced. 
so it took us a while to decide which tools to to narrow to, to to narrow down and we decided to investigate in more detail actually envision marvel and adobe xd and based on their descriptions or what they offer uh, we are looking for the most appropriate tool um, based on the, the type of prototype that we're building, the type of application, uh, because it was a mobile app and we were looking for swiping uh, gestures and animations. And um, we wanted to make it to be, to be fast to build this thing. And initially we were thinking someone will create the, the, the UI design and someone else will create the interactions. Um, and at this point, we we decided to use Marvel. It was the most simple one. Um, ah, before we decided to use Marvel, uh, we created uh, a sample prototype on each of these tools on Actual Envision, Marvel, and Adobe XD, based on the screens from the prototype. So you can see on the bottom right, there we use those uh, those sketches from the um, from the storyboard. We use those sketches. To build a, a quick prototype with a couple of screens, three or four screens, uh, and, and then we concluded that Marvel was the fastest one to create um, a prototype based on existing uh, assets. The truth is that uh, as we progressed with building the prototype and it, it became more and more complex, um, Marvel turned out to be very cumbersome and very heavy on the browser because it ran on the browser. So I had to switch back to Azure. <clears throat> so during the prototyping, each team member was responsible for finding assets and content for the prototype. Assets, I mean uh, the objects that we are adding, the photos. Um, content, I mean the names of the zones, the names of those objects, the descriptions of those zones, um, the labels to put on each button. Um, uh, marketing uh, materials, every single text and word that's on the prototype, it's real content. We don't use any lorem lipsum or fake content. Everything kind of makes sense. Uh, so you had uh, people um, looking for, for, for that content and for those assets. And uh, at the same time, uh, an, another uh, person was doing the um, stitching up uh, the, the whole thing and making the interactions in uh, in Axure. During that period, we did a, a dry run with a friendly user, and that allowed us to find some major issues that we quickly we quickly solved. And a few days later, we, we tested again between ourselves, uh, and we cross-checked it with the scenarios that we wanted to test to see, can we test the scenarios with this prototype? And when we were happy with it, um, we we stopped and, and we were ready to test. So for testing the book, the the design sprint book by Jack Knapp, he proposes he has some tips and hints for uh, making scripts for tests. Um, but there's also a, a, a test script for usability testing by Steve Krug on record surgery made easy. Uh, and in the past, we used that, that, that script and it worked out really well. So we adapted from both sources and we created our own script. Um, and our script was based on three main scenarios related with these topics, finding and navigating urban planning zones, uh, adding ideas to urban planning zone, uh, meaning citizens adding their own ideas, and uh, citizens voting and commenting and sharing ideas that they find in, in, in urban planning zones. Uh, so we, we have conducted six user tests with two females and four males aged between 27 and 67, but most of them were between 27 and 30 uh, something. There was only one that was uh, 67 years old. And uh, what worked well was the, the, the concept, the general uh, concept of the application, um, meaning using uh, a mobile application for participating in urban planning, uh, also using the augmented reality as a way to see and to interact with urban planning. Uh, the perceived usefulness of the, of the application was also very positive. The overall UI design and interactions, even though we're not testing that, we got good feedback on that. Test completion was um, 
well, most users were able to complete most tasks successfully. Um, people liked that they could vote and comment and, and share um, their ideas and other people's ideas. Uh, and it was a, a good idea, according to users, to use augmented reality for, for interacting with, uh, with urban planning. Uh, where we need more improvement is uh, providing clear actions uh, on the application because this is a new concept for most people. It's not straightforward to them how to add uh, objects on the street or, or how to uh, use the, the camera and augmented reality to find things on the street. Uh, the, pro the, the part where the actual augmented reality is, the, that part should have a dedicated prototype just for itself because it's such a, a specific interaction. Uh, we should dedicate some more time doing a, a proper uh, prototype for that. Uh, navigation was not perfect. Um, some users would like to uh, search for things differently or they were not able to find things as easier as we, we thought they could. Um, and, that's, and there's a typo in the end, sorry about that. Uh, new ideas, we also got new ideas from uh, talking with users. So they suggested that um, what if I want to, um, one user said, what if I want to, to interact with a zone but I can't be physically be there, I can't be there, I can't go there. So it would be interesting to have uh, a way to interact with the zone without having to be there with uh, 360 images, for example, spherical images where they could see the zone, uh, but at home, for example. Um, having users to create their own zones, uh, moderating comments, um, and to have a dislike button so people could say, I don't like this idea. Uh, and they provide comments saying why they didn't like that idea. Uh, one uh, curious uh, quote from a user about augmented reality in urban planning uh, is that it's better to show people rather than telling uh, people uh, when talking about the plans. And uh, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Congratulations on a very well presented and well-rounded uh, body of work in terms of the process as well as the outcome. Uh, before going through my questions, and uh, Panagotis has also sent me a few uh, to ask um, your group, I'd like to open it up to the other group or even, even your colleagues within the same group if you have any comments or questions or opinions, clarifications. Anybody? Going once, going twice? Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll begin with, um, with a few of my questions. Um, so it's been clear for your group from the beginning that the users were the citizens. And because the, the whole approach and process was centered around the citizens, you have come up with a specific approach. I was wondering um, if you have considered uh, that the users were the town planners, uh, so f a bit from the other side of the spectrum, how do you yeah. think, uh, yeah, hello? Yeah, so um, I actually have a, a, a friend who's a town planner and we were supposed to be doing testing with her, but then she went out of town and wasn't answering our texts um, in time for us to work on the project. So. Um, we ended up using users who were more in line with the the, the citizens than the town planners, um, but she gave mm -hmm. us a lot of good info up front. Um, so I think that the thing that um, guided us from from the town planners' perspective is that um, usually the, the the way that we that that town planners get info from from their part, from the participants of focus groups produces very particular types of engagement. So a, a focus group will um, feature interested parties, but without providing um, much like visual sense of what the project's going to be like. So um, it was quite a, quite a cool shift in her perspective for us to see, uh, 
to see that we were wanting to take the planning elements that might happen kind of either in a mock-up graphic or maybe in a model and how we take that into the community and make it quite a, a, a visceral interpretation of a design. So, for example, um, seeing a building where it was going to be built using a, a digital device would have made it much more uh, readable to the standard focus group than seeing like a model of their of their zone and seeing how a building was going to be built. So that was quite a cool bit of feedback. She was really keen to see how our project turned out. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your response. And in uh, in relation to to this, Panayotis has just asked me. Um, so user-centered design, the, the classic UCD uh, process and methods, involve users uh, throughout all of the stages. While design involves users at the beginning, uh, as you have done, and at the end of the process when you, when you do some testing. Uh, do you think this has influenced your work in a small degree, a large degree, or has it influenced much in, in terms of how the, the process and the activities were carried out? Uh, I, I think it influenced immensely. I mean, uh, when we started, we didn't, or at least I didn't know what, what the problem was. And when we started investigating and understanding what we are talking about, and when we started to interview people, uh, then we realized, oh, okay, so there is actual a problem, a user problem that, um, that we could uh, solve. Um, and everything that we have decided, the, the sprint questions and the how my three notes are driven from that feedback, from what we got from, from the interviews and from research. Mm -hmm. I think what Panagiotis is asking is, for example, if you had users involved at the end of every day, in quotation marks, for example, would that have influenced uh, more towards the benefit of the process or the outcome, or uh, maybe it w it wasn't needed uh, in such an extent. Yeah, I, mean, I, I feel yeah. I feel like it would it would definitely have benefited, but the challenge of um, each day essentially being a two week span meant that having people who were engaged over that period as we were was going to be incredibly challenging. I don't know if you feel the same, Joe. Uh, I think in my experience says that. Uh, highly beneficial to have users even on the team so if you could have like a, a full-time user or a full-time pool of users um, attending all the all the sessions and all the all the exercises is extremely beneficial and for sure it 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 uh, um, it makes us make uh, some turns that we are not uh, expecting but not always that is feasible, not always we have access to users, uh, or we don't have the time, or we don't have uh, the resources uh, to have users. But, but I agree, if we are the user at every step, we probably end up on, on a different, um, either we end up on a different place, or we could reach the end result faster. Mm -hmm. I, th I think this is very interesting. I, I also think since we're moving into um, method territory, questions. Um, you have adapted the design sprint process to run essentially in segments that involve a weekly engagement from the group rather than a five-day sprint of a daily full-time engagement that's typically done. Mm -hmm. So in what way do you think it has affected the process either um, positively or negatively? The, the increase of time between sessions has allowed you to Think, this, think things over or investigate on your own. Uh, especially, I think some of you have uh, also applied the design sprint process in your uh, daily practices and in, in, in your companies the way it's supposed to be, the, the five day period. So, what do you think is your reflection towards the actual sprint and how it has been implemented here? Uh, in, I, I think that uh, each of us. Should, I think we have different opinions or, or I think it's it's a personal uh, thing uh, or, but I think that you have to be very disciplined if you want to follow the design sprint 
uh, as Jake uh, describes it in a book, uh, in a remote way and in several weeks instead of uh, five days. Because these exercises that are described here, most of them are thinking about this uh, time frame and, and collocated. And when you do it, uh, especially when, when you spread the time and when you're doing, for example, the, 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 the crazy eight exercise, um, you don't feel the pressure uh, as if you were doing it on a five day sprint. You have more time, you have more time to think about it, you have time to search, you have time to, 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 to do it m more times. You have to, you, when I was doing it, I did do only one version of Crazy 8. I did a few iterations of Crazy 8. I had time, I liked to do it, and I did it over and over again. And in the, eight, in the end, I only uh, presented the ones that I liked the most. So, uh, yeah. I agree. I found it um, quite, I found like we lost momentum after each big, like each end of week session, we'd have like a lot of momentum at the end of week session and then we'd all taper out and then we'd have like a week like lag. In, in waves. Yeah. And so I feel like, I mean, I've, I've worked with sprint methodology at work and it's been it's been very intense and obviously that's one of the drawbacks that some people find it very overwhelming and honestly if you if you have um people in all different places with different full-time jobs it would be impossible to run a like a, a full-time sprint without everyone taking leave from work but um yeah i agree with sean sean saying that the timer helped yeah the timer really did help Zhao put a timer on the bottom of our whiteboard and that made us feel a lot, a lot more like um the, the time we were putting yeah the time that we were putting in made made like made a difference rather than just kind of like oh well we'll waft towards the end of the hand in and then we'll just hand in and then it'll be fine mm -hmm. thank you for your honesty as well i mean one of the questions I've written down is regarding the, the crazy aids in the sketching segment. And I was wondering if you had taken, you know, extra time in, in carrying out those exercises that are normally quite time uh, sensitive and uh, that they need to happen actually in a quite quick pace just because the, the whole aim of the methodology is to force the mind and the person to go through the motions and the exercises uh, quite quickly. So the, the questions <coughs> I, I had written down um, in terms of this is if you were to choose um, one aspect or one exercise of the whole sprint that you will say it will have been best to have spent more time on it uh, than what is actually allowed in the original uh, Jake Knapp's version of the design sprint process, uh, what will that be and why? Uh, for me, would be the, the 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 part where you present the like the, the art gallery part where you present everybody's ideas and you vote and you discuss on that. Um, that was very insightful uh, activity. I, that that was the time where I really really learned uh, about each other's perspective and, and what they were suggesting and what they were thinking. Um, that was the most insightful activity but maybe only because we did it remotely. If we would be co-located, maybe this wasn't as important as it was for us. Or yeah, so building on what you said, Joe, um, I think that that was so important for us because that was one of the main times that we actually spent quite a lot of time in the same, in the same video chat, in the same space, essentially. So like that was one of the key moments that we recreated that synchronous space. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, one maybe last question, I think at the interest of time. Um, did you observe different comments or competencies in using uh, your, um, the example you have developed, the um, prototype between users of different ages? Uh, because augmented realities, uh, I'm not sure if it has a, a higher entry barrier, but I mean, in this particular case, I was wondering if you have observed uh, any different approaches or comments. Well, most uh, 
most I, I I only did one one test. I only watched the, the other tests, but I didn't talk with the with the users. I think each of us talked with a different user. But the the I the impression that I had is that most users between the twenty seven and the thirty something ages, uh, they behave more or less the same. And the only user that was sixty seven years old, the woman, uh, she behaved completely different way. She was paying attention to completely different things than all the other. Uh, participants. It would be interesting to test this with different um, age groups, for sure. Mm -hmm. can, can you elaborate a bit? In what way did she uh, behave differently? Well, for instance, uh, she was paying a lot of attention to um, non-functional part of the prototype. Uh, she was, for for instance, she was looking at the uh, on the, on the home page. There is this illustration. She's paying a lot of attention to what's on that illustration, um, and it was a little bit difficult for her to understand the the augmented reality concept um, using the camera. And especially also maybe because the, the prototype was not that perfect uh, on the augmented reality part. Whereas the other users, they quickly saw, okay, so this, this is illustrations, this, uh, they're scanning through the app and see, looking for actions and what they can do with it. They're way, way quicker, faster to understand what they can do with it. Yeah, I think this is very interesting, especially since there are particular age groups that usually uh, come to public consultations for urban planning schemes, or they they have time to offer you know detailed feedback in, in this sort of uh, framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you guys very much. Really enjoy the presentation, and Panagiotis this also agrees with me on on the chat. Uh, we'll move on to the next group. Uh, who will be presenting? Uh, I'll start. Oh dear. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay. Sorry, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how I start this. Oh wait. Okay, so you should all be able to see my screen. In a moment. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, so our presentation is uh, Plan R. And so as the previous team discussed, we know that the current methods used to encourage public participation, such as forums, surveys, etc., may not actually foster adequate participation. And so after conducting and combining results of our preliminary literary research, we defined our end goal as designing an AR or augmented reality app to help citizens visualize the end result of urban planning projects so they're more likely or motivated to participate in that process. So we also interviewed a number of experts and our further research from these expert interviews, which included a city planner, um, in that group. Um, we found that uh, these experts told us that not all relevant stakeholders are included in the urban planning process. Um, they're not involved early enough. They may be involved at the end to get their opinion once all decisions have been made. Another one of the issues with the current system is citizens not having a sense of ownership over those decisions. So the decisions are made and they don't hear feedback again. Um, another subset 
of issues identified from the experts were potential and current barriers. And so one of those barriers that they identified was the lack of means to participate. So maybe not having the time um, or the ability or even knowing how to participate. Um, potential digital divide or exclusion. Um, the city planner, one of the city planners we spoke with, or the city planner we did speak with, noted that um, a lot of the ways that they try to reach out to people is using things like social media, um, which may exclude a certain number of people. Um, finally, they discussed a lack of education um, in terms of what's being presented to them, or a lack of trust in the system, and that could relay back to not knowing whether or not their feedback is actually being heard. Finally, um, one of the experts identified that the current one of the current tools that are used can act as a potential barrier, which is relying largely on social media, so that digital divide, or using physical meetings, such as those forums and hearings, people may not have the ability to actually physically attend and participate in that way. <clears throat> so the key themes that we identified uh, throughout the sprint were bridging technological, technological limitations and that digital divide we looked at trying to make that participation process seamless and easy. Um, through that, we also wanted to leverage existing platforms and social media. So there is a subsection of the population for whom that would be um, appropriate. We kept in the back of our minds uh, the possibility of getting, uh, getting buy-in from the public and encouraging participation, as well as getting buy-in from officials and city planners. So from all the research that we gathered, we decided to focus on the steps within our map, which involve the actual presentation of the project designs and ideas, um, presenting those ideas in uh, an augmented reality or virtual reality environment, and then getting feedback from citizens and uh, engaging them for evaluation. So we found a lot of existing apps and concepts for inspiration. And some of these included um, apps that are already existing. Um, the Find It and Fix It app that is used in Seattle. Uh, the next one is the Citizen Connect app, which is used in Boston. And what some of these apps do is they provide real-time reporting of issues reported by citizens. Uh, the app on the right is a geomapping app, and that's used by citizens to create alerts, categorize current city problems, including things such as infrastructure or public transportation or accessibility. Uh, we also found inspiring um, the idea that citizen requests that are entered into these apps could be accessed by city officials, and that some of these applications could make use of push notifications for real-time communication, um, that some of these apps would display progress on current projects, and we also liked the idea, um, and that's noted in that geomapping app, of the ability to actually follow projects visually on maps. Uh, but in addition to existing apps that are out there, we found inspiration from other sources. Um, there are applications out there that have the ability to um, provide measurements or dimensions that will help with visualizing uh, from an interior decorating perspective or an application where you hold it up and it provides text or more information about a specific um, landmark in the environment. Um, even going uh, as unusual as uh, looking at potential delivery methods. So the one on the right, which is um, kind of a visualizer, or a, I think it's a uh, binocular system, um, which is non-digital. And like the other group, um, looked at things like IKEA Place, which provides the ability to place their products within your space and to see things in 3D and at scale, and uh, other applications that are used in, um, in kind of parallel industries like the construction industry, which would provide the ability to visualize an end result of a project. So 
So after looking at all the inspiration, um, per the design sprint process, we completed the Crazy Eights activities, uh, also conducted it synchronously and timed everything. And then we took a step back and allowed people to create their subsequent storyboards on their own. Uh, the interesting thing about the storyboards that were created was that we each inadvertently created storyboards that addressed different parts of the journey without uh, even discussing that we would take on specific parts. And uh, so I found that really quite fascinating. But what it allowed for us to do was that when we put our actual final storyboard together, it was pretty easy to pull from different sections of the storyboards that were created without a lot of, um, we didn't really have to go back and create, or recreate certain aspects of the storyboard. I think just the beginning part of it, but everything that we had um, had designed separately came together quite well. So some of the features and elements that we liked from our storyboards uh, were the uh, have including a visual map view to leverage um, kind of a mental model that people are already comfortable with. So for example, as seen in Google Maps. Um, including a menu on the bottom for the ability to, um, I guess, prompt for comments uh, and alerts. The ability to navigate between existing and potential projects uh, as a means to encourage contributions from citizens. Um, we liked the concept of including the ability to vote, um, and not only to vote, but to also see how other citizens and other people in the community felt about specific projects. There was a, one storyboard that included a top menu that would also foster interactivity. So adding comments, taking images, um, and also again, leveraging some of the uh, elements that already exist in social media, such as sharing, upvoting, and downvoting. And then finally, the ability to actually view and see the final product or project within the environment. Uh, so, Stephanie, I'm not sure, did you want to jump in at this point? Sure. So, as Avina said, we have determined some form of um, storyboard based on all our different uh, storyboards and Crazy 8 sketches. So, the next step for us was to sort of map out what the ideal user journey would be that encompasses all those different features that we identified in our storyboards. So. Um, we decided to start at the beginning where someone would maybe learn about the application. Um, a common place would maybe be a poster on a, um, a lamppost, actually something that one of our group members spotted in real life, and that's where the idea came from. Um, that poster then would contain a QR code that a user can scan, taking them straight to the App Store. So they could potentially be on um, a project site, see the poster, scan it, download the app, and then select their current location to pick up the area that they're in and have access to the projects around them. They could then select the project that they're either standing at, so leveraging the AR view and in-person project, or they could be at home and want to look at projects in their surrounding areas. So then once they select the project that they're interested in, um, our idea was to give them multiple views. So as Abina mentioned, one of our big issues was how do we bridge the digital divide or what happens if someone's phone doesn't have the technological capability um, to present AR or VR, what alternatives can we use? So we decided that for each project, we would have an AR view for people who were on the actual project site and would like to see it in reality, um, a VR view for people at home that might have goggles and would like to have a look at it, and a 3D mock-up view where it will just render a 3D plan. Um, from that view, they can then explore various aspects of the project. So if it's a building, they could have a look at the rooms um, and different features. And they could then, if you could just jump to the next slide, please, Abina. Um, they could then provide commentary on it. So on the exact area that they're talking about, so the specific room or the window or the part of the bridge, um, they could then type a comment, categorize that comment as either a question, a concern, um, or as in various categories and then post it. They could also then have access to a discussion of sorts, looking at what other people have said about it and providing um, replies or feedback to those comments. Um, another way to encourage interactivity would then be to be able to upvote or downvote comments as well as upvote or downvote the project as a whole. 
um, to see overall support. So that's the basic user journey that we try to get through. It was quite ambitious um, and took quite a few steps. Yeah, you can jump ahead, thanks. So as Abina said, we um, all created a different part of the storyboard unintentionally. And when we put it together, it made quite a nice user journey. The only issue was there was no consistent UI or navigation. So we had the high level steps we wanted at each point and a few key features that um, each person brought to the table. And we, were quite confident, we weren't quite confident going from this into the prototyping phase without sort of bridging that UI navigation issue. So we decided to build a wireframe before going into the prototype, which we then did in XD. So yeah, sorry, then the name also resulted from that storyboarding session, um, Urban Planner, uh, play on the, obviously the words plan AR and planner, like a city planner. Um, yeah, again, it was someone's storyboard name and it just fitted and the whole group loved it. So we went into the wireframing stage, um, very much just black and white, focusing on the key features and how the navigation and user journey would flow all the way from the poster that they see up until um, viewing and adding a comment um, within a 3D or VR space. So from this wireframe, um, after discussing it and working out the kinks that we could find at this stage, which seemed to be quite an important um, stage, giving us some preliminary feedback from each other, we moved into the design phase um, and the prototyping phase. So the design and the UI was done in Illustrator. We struggled initially to figure out what tool to use to prototype it, mainly because we wanted to embed AR, VR, and 3D models. And all of those came from external sites. Um, so we struggled to find a, a prototyping tool that would let us embed those links. Um, so our prototyping went through a few stages. It started in Illustrator, it then moved to Google Slides, and finally ended up on Articulate Storyline, um, actually an e-learning program that we then used to make it interactive. So then these links that we embedded um, came from VIA, which um, allowed for VR and AR view and an existing model of a bridge we found on Sketchfab. Um, all of this was added to Illustrator, uh, to Illustrator, sorry, added to Storyline, made interactive, published and hosted on GitHub. Um, then we have a short video on the end product. So this would be once you've um, scanned the QR code and taken to the App Store, download the app, sign up. And very importantly, select your country to know what um, projects are available around you. And then also we added links to the social media platforms trying to integrate um, our platform with other popular existing platforms. We then embedded a Google Maps. Um, we decided to use um, a section of Brazil. So you set your location and then you can go and view various things. So the part that we were focusing on was projects. Um, so you can see the location at the top and then the pins represent the different projects. The project we chose to build out was a bridge restoration. So at this stage users can um, either look at the project view like, th like that in the map or um, the AR view where they can literally move their device around and see what projects pop up around them. And then lastly, they can view the projects as a list. So if a user goes into the project, we provide some basic detail about it and then three different options of how to view it. A 3D view, a VR view and an AR view. We added some basic information like the cost and some history um, to the project. Here is the Sketchfab embedded view. The, obviously one of the limitations was having the controls from Sketchfab the, um, that we couldn't get rid of, but in the final application there wouldn't be any of those controls. Then yeah, the AR view and the three, the, the VR view were the same at this point, um, with the ability to add a comment on specific sections with the username appearing at the top. You can attach files or images. So for example, if you have a reference image of something you really like, you can attach it to your comment. And another way to 
um, get to the comments is through the discussion panel. That's the other view. And then the discussion panel, very much like a Facebook feed where you can view everyone's comments, reply to them, like them, dislike them. It helps to give a general impression of um, what people are thinking and be able to really engage in a, a discussion. Cool. So from there, we moved on to coming up with a plan for the user testing, which Abina will talk through. Okay, so we all um, conducted an interview, and um, here we have a, a chart that shows our user demographics. So we have ages, uh, four females, one male, ages ranging from 27 to 59. And a variety of occupations. So um, we wanted to um, have interviewers that reflected, you know, clearly we're all in different parts of the world, so international, but also reflected quite a, a broad spectrum. Um, and it could be very similar to what you would see in a community. So using the guidelines from the sprint, we didn't have a specific, necessarily a specific interview script. There was a lot of prompting. So, you know, what would you do if you saw this button? What do you think happens on this screen? That being said, however, we wanted to ensure that users navigated through what we felt were some of the most important scenarios of the um, prototype. And so those were selecting the bridge restoration project from either the pins on the map or via the list, selecting each of the views within the project details, adding a comment, and making a note as to which entry point they used, either through the discussions or on the project itself, and then um, asking them or prompting them to vote on either the project or on an existing comment. So the results from the testing, uh, we kind of grouped them into themes. The first theme that uh, arose was that we felt that we really needed to improve the onboarding experience. Uh, despite us providing a verbal introduction to the project, several users found it challenging to navigate to the projects once they had downloaded the app. Um, one user specifically felt that including a description of the app's purpose on the landing page would have been quite helpful. The next theme was that the icons and terminology needed to be more clear. Um, this I found really uh, this was interesting that uh, one user, actually a couple of users, no, one user in particular was unfamiliar with the terms VR and AR, uh, mistaking the latter, mistaking AR to mean aerial rather than augmented reality. And so um, that, that's actually a huge, a huge point considering that the whole uh, focus of the app was that AR. Um, and then some of the icons. So a couple of users didn't recognize that tapping on the pins on the map would actually link them to specific projects. Um, the next theme though, which was a positive, was that using familiar icons and leveraging other platform design patterns was well received. So things like the upvoting or the thumbs up, thumbs down for upvoting and downvoting and the speech bubble for comments um, worked out to our advantage. Um, next pattern, users had unclear expectations of the views, AR and VR. Um, so two of the users felt that the description of each of those views could have been more clear. And so, for example, one user expected that the AR view would show what the project would look like in the future, whereas one of them thought that it was potentially showing what it, what it looked like currently. And so that was something that, we, that uh, arose from the testing. Um, the fifth pattern um, is that there are concerns that arose around privacy and access. So one user noted that they would have felt reluctant to enter their information. And they weren't sure what was going to happen with the user data when they entered in their name and password. And another user uh, was concerned about um, authenticating users. So ensuring that anyone who commented on a project in, you know, my city actually lived in my city and didn't live elsewhere. Uh, and then finally, um, the last theme arose around the detail uh, in the project. So this came from the older users. They actually wanted more detail and more information about the projects. 
um, because they felt that that was really the only way in which they felt comfortable providing an informed decision. Uh, and so from these themes, uh, we went ahead and and actually acted upon some of these next steps. And I think Joseph's going to speak to this. Hey, guys. So uh, uh, since this app is not a usual app, it's not a social media app. So uh, the users were not used to uh, these kinds of apps. So we thought of and also th this app is not tailored only for a certain range age. So this app will be used for uh, with different uh, ages, older people, and uh, even uh, younger people. So we thought on in a, uh, how to uh, improve the app onboarding, improve the app experience, and how can we help our users to understand the purpose of this app. So we thought of creating, uh, based on our users' feedback, a small tour. So when you launch uh, the app for the first time, you'll have like a small tour telling you about the app and the purpose of the app, and it focuses on the main features we have uh, in, the, in this app. So it helps you to know that this app is tailored for uh, urban uh, development. Uh, here you can explore projects, learn more about the projects in your city. Uh, you can get uh, more engaged, uh, and you can like, comment, like, dislike, and you can use uh, AR, so here we explained also what AR and VR are, since um, some users didn't understand what, what AR are or even VR, so they got a bit confused. So here also we explained what AR and VR uh, are about, and when the user is ready, he can kickstart the app or he can relaunch the tool to maybe have uh, a second look before uh, launching the app. So this is what the uh, one of the uh, things we we thought about. Uh, second, we we thought how to uh, fix the app, improve and fix the app navigation. Uh, so uh, many users didn't understand some icons uh, because also, as I mentioned, some icons are new because uh, it's a new app, uh, AR, VR. Uh, so it's different. It's not a, a typical app. So we thought of adding like. Uh, just uh, small labels uh, for the menu. So you can see for the toolbar, you can see that we added the home uh, and we added 360 view and settings. So for older people will we'll, we'll quickly understand what these icons are all about. Also, uh, some uh, users didn't understand that uh, these pins uh, are uh, for the projects. And when you click on a pin, you will you'll go to the project. So we thought about uh, uh about adding the pin so that the pin will be already opened when you open the the map view so we'll see directly a pin opened and we added the explore button so here users will understand that when they click on the explore they can see the the projects they can explore it they can read about more details so those were the the changes we made uh, based on the user's uh, feedback and on the user testing. Uh, also, uh, we, we added like more colors. So as you can see also in the in the app landing in the tour, uh, we got a feedback uh, from from user maybe to, to make it like more vibrant. So we added more colors uh, to it to, so it looks more appealing. So Great, I can hear. Yeah, um, I think the screen may have stopped sharing. Um, I'm struggling to see it. Is anyone else able to see it? Oh, there we go. Sorry, that's my mistake. So um, those are the main suggestions that we implemented. Um, the Some other suggestions that we then um, didn't get time to implement, but thought would be uh, the next steps for going forward is to carry on using commonly known UI patterns. So most of the confusion seemed to come from um, patterns or symbols that weren't commonly used in other platforms. So as the, like Abina said, the upvoting and downvoting was very obvious to all our testers. Um, other things like the AR view and VR view was not as common. Um, another thing, especially for the older users, was to add a small text description to the screens, showing that at this time they are now seeing an AR view, a 3D view, a VR view, and to explain if it's something that, um, how the project looks at the moment, 
or the proposal of what it's going to look at. One of our users um, saw the 3D bridge and said, oh, is this what it currently looks like? Why would you need to fix it up? We can just leave it like this, whereas actually the bridge doesn't look like that, and that was the proposed design for the new bridge. So just some small um, textual clues as to what they're seeing. Um, and then one of the big things was building in an authentication for users, so to ensure that they are citizens of the area they're commenting on, so that their opinions um, directly correlate to the decisions that are made. Obviously, um, users having the concern that they don't want their, the money that they're paying for tax to be decided where it goes by other users. Um, so to only have a say within their own communities. Um, another thing also coming from all the older users was wanting to know a bit more about the project before they felt like they could make a vote. So wanting to know a bit more about the costs, who's building it, um, a bit more of the history of the project um, to be able to make a more informed decision. So the idea with there would be to include some links to articles, maybe Wikipedia pages if it's a prominent um, project, and just links to more information explaining the, the, um, the project. And then lastly, specifically to address the digital divide issue, um, one of our other suggestions was to create alternatives for people who don't have a smartphone or aren't technologically capable um, of downloading an app. So to have public places like libraries to install um, alternative versions of the application, such as on PCs and libraries, and then having the, um, the staff at those public areas be trained in how to use the app. So to be able to guide um, citizens to also interact and to vote. Okay, so we're just reiterating our end goal, which is to design an AR app to help citizens visualize the end result of urban planning projects to increase motivation and participation. And ultimately, um, we found that the users uh, all agreed that uh, the app could act as a motivator and as a way to engage citizens to participate in their city's uh, urban planning process. And one, not necessarily a quote, but one kind of um, um, one observation that stood out was that one user thought that uh, approaching it this way would simplify the citizen engagement process. Uh, she found that her current method of, citizen, of civic engagement was very time consuming, signing petitions, you know, leaving your house and going out physically to do it. So she thought this would be um, a, great, a great way to, um, to simplify the process. And then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed this. Uh, I was uh, wondering if the other group have had any comments or feedback uh, before moving on to uh, Panagiotis' questions and my own. Maybe a comment on uh, how how the, the method had a, uh, had very small deviations uh, in terms of the previous group we have watched. Um, and I thought it's quite interesting how both no. groups have come up solutions. Hi, hi, Ja. Hi. Uh, I, have, I have a question um, about the, the process that you took uh, versus the process that is proposed on the, on the design sprint book. It looks like it's uh, not as close to the, 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 the book than what the other group did. Uh, am I wrong, or if you, if if I'm not wrong, why why did you do that? Is there a specific um, methodology that you're that you're referencing, or no? I, I mean, the, I'm asking. My understanding is that you didn't do exactly the the activities that are proposed in in the book. Uh, I, I would argue that we, that we did. That's why I'm asking if there's a specific activity that you felt didn't didn't. Oh, okay, so so I was understanding that that you didn't. So that, that was that was my question. Uh, if, uh, if you did and if you didn't, why why you didn't do it? Okay. Oh, I see. Yes, no, we, we uh, did. We, we did. I think I don't think we were very specific in the presentation as to okay. maybe we did this, but we did follow the methodology. Okay. Thank you. I, th I yeah, think maybe the storyboard was slightly different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to add to that, we. Um, we tried not to sort of repeat the steps in the presentation, so we did do those, but we um, we try to summarize a bit more and just show the outcomes of it. But yeah, we did do all the different steps in the book, which led to the storyboard we came up with. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's my understanding that the, um, the storyboarding for the storyboarding uh, step, you initially combined various aspects of the three stage sketches uh, that were produced earlier, or did you split up the process of the storyboard so everybody did a part of it and then you you tried to combine it? Well, we took the crazy eights, and from the crazy eights, then we created the three tile storyboard. Um, we then came together and took elements of, of each of those three tiles to combine them into our final, you know, 12 or 15 tile um, storyboard as defined in the, in the sprint book. Hmm. Yeah, I think maybe that's the, the part Zhao was referencing. Okay. Uh, because while it's slightly different, we also found from our own experience when applying the design sprint process that it's useful to sometimes consider the three-step sketches as just three parts of the storyboard, and then you can pick them apart and sort of expand on it during the storyboarding uh, segment. So I, I was wondering if that was the purpose of your approach as well. Yeah, I think that, that is how we approached it. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to start from the, the, the comment you had about authenticating access to, to residents and the, the concern that uh, one of the users had in uh, the participation of, of other users being users of the, of the neighborhood or of the area. And um, this is a question that uh, Panayotis has identified. Uh, which rings true in this case that often the, the public consultation process is influenced by various conflicts and by different actors' personal lists. And when uh, obviously launch such an application, these personal interests will come into view, they will be masked under various personas and users. Uh, so I was wondering if this issue was discussed during the design process or how do you suggest facilitating or managing the various interests that will uh, uh, become evident through through the use of your application. Um, we didn't really discuss it. It wasn't only something that came up at the end um, after the user testing. I'm not sure if this fully answers your question, but we were looking at ideas of um, authenticating users based on their ID numbers and things like that. So we had a plan for how to authenticate citizens, um, but we haven't quite, I guess, thought through um, the different stakeholders and how to manage their interests. I'm not sure if someone else in the group had any to add to that. Hmm. I think it's more of a general question that applies to actually both groups. You know, evidently, when you when you issue a, an application that is meant to gather feedback for contentious issues such as uh, the various urban planning processes or proposals. Uh, people with uh, conflicting in interests will find ways to try and influence the outcome, uh, which sort of leads on to another question, which is, uh, you know, in, in the most contentious projects uh, that you, you, you use uh, at the application, um, there will be evidently hundreds or maybe thousands of comments, likes, dislikes. There will be a lot of user engagement. So, uh, how would how would um, a town planning officer or a decision maker, for example, um, what would be a useful approach to understand the data in a way that's meaningful? Given that you can't do any you know text qualitative methods that will analyze and come up with themes because uh, everything or most of the things have special ramifications or uh, they're concerning specific, you know, spaces or uh, geotagged uh, locations within a proposal. Was this any part of the discussion? Um, um, oh, sorry. Uh, we did discuss briefly about moderation of, uh, of comments, but then we, we ended up thinking that there, there just wouldn't be any bandwidth to do that. But uh, from personal experience, I feel that um, in these scenarios where people can upvote or downvote um, comments, points, uh, suggestions, anything, the community itself ends up ordering those, um, those answers. Just like I can quote 
Stack Overflow, which is a very com which is a very popular um, Q and A platform for software developers. You can basically find any solution there, and the community itself uh, orders the the best solutions to, to any given problems. So the first thing that comes to my mind when you ask this is perhaps um, increasing the improving the functionality of the upvote downvote the, the the like feature and make that more quantitative and then give that importance. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's interesting how you have brought up an example from a completely different field in a sense, like Stack Overflow, to uh, provide a solution for a different problem, which makes me think whether um, it's worth thinking about at the earlier stages of the sprint when you try and find out examples of how others resolve the various issues. And I think both teams went on to find examples, specific examples on combining AR and urban planning, and there are quite a few, uh, that actually other examples, not directly linked to the, to the problem per se, might uh, provide insightful solutions to, to similar problems, like, like now in Stack Overflow. Um, Moving on to the to the next question, um, Simon was asking, "What was the biggest challenge while following the process?" I think having it um, done remotely was our biggest challenge. So we span a lot of different time zones with very different schedules. So all being able to come together and meet was our most productive times, but also the hardest to schedule. Um, and then when one of us was working and needed feedback, the others were at work or asleep. So it's very difficult to keep momentum, as Laura was saying, um, when things are so spread out. Um, and obviously because they were spread out over weeks instead of days, whereas that did give us a lot of time to think and a lot of time to um, look for ideas, it also meant that momentum was very difficult to keep. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. It was it was the momentum. There were certain certain days I think are much more engaging. Uh, maybe that's not the right word. Are more involved than others. And and you know once you get started and you're going with it, um, having that few days pass in between um, in between meeting or in between even discussing, um, it, it felt a little bit um, a little defeating in some ways. Um, I think that project like this would be really it would be really interesting to see it played out in a five day sprint um, to see just to kind of feel that momentum versus the the remote in this in the spread out time frame uh, also I would like to add for uh, if we need to apply the, uh, the user testing uh, same as the book uh, it was really hard because in the book you have you need to have two rooms and you, have, you need to do the testing at the same time uh, interviewer inside and the rest of the team taking notes. So I think uh, none of the teams were were able to do this uh, uh, same as the book recommends. So uh, th this is why we didn't experience the the real uh, feel of the user testing uh, uh, recommended in the book, having two rooms and interviewers. And so it was each one of us doing his own interview and. Uh, then we tried to have a, a board when we, we all watched the videos and added our notes. However, it wasn't the, uh, the same uh, like having uh, one, one room with the interviewer and another room with the, with the rest of the team taking notes. So it was a bit different from the book. So I would like to also uh, know how, Andreas, you recommend having the testing uh, remotely. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, what other teams have done in the in the previous years, and um, I think in an extent you all did, is that people have uh, split the users, so everybody does one user, but then they've recorded the session, and they have uploaded these sessions uh, for everybody to watch prior to doing a synchronous session, um, where they discuss the results. So when people watch the videos asynchronously, they try and write down uh, notes in categories in terms of what has been observed. And then they they upload these notes in a platform like uh, the whiteboard, for example. 
um, and then they will try and categorize together in a, in a synchronous session. So in, in essence, while you, you don't exactly apply it like, like the sprint, there are, there are various merits towards, towards doing this as well, because um, if all the members of the team watch the interviews asynchronously and they write down comments, then you can uh, sort of rank comments in, in how often the, the team members will, uh, will list out the same themes. So you can sort of hierarchically categorize what's important and what's perceived as important by the various team members. Uh, yeah, it's similar as what Zhao is currently uh, describing in, in the chat. Yes, yes, uh, we, I, we I, did this also, Andreas. We recorded all the all the videos, all the interviews, and then everyone added his notes on the board. So we tried to make make it very, very similar to the book. But I'm just saying that uh, it's not the, the 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 real, let's say, the real feel of testing when you have like the room. With all the uh, with all the uh, let's say the team sitting together taking notes and in the other room you have the interviewer. So I'm just saying that the, it's it's a bit different when when you, you're doing it uh, in person. Let's yeah, say. yeah. I mean we've never had a team that attempted to do it uh, synchronously while remotely. Uh, I, I think it's the greatest challenge of uh, adjusting process to run online. Uh, one final question, maybe. Uh, so, very recently, we were discussing with uh, an elected uh, official about uh, the public participation in the planning process. And his view, uh, which is interesting, was that um, people elect their representatives, and actually, people don't know uh, a lot about what they want. So, their elected representatives should be able to make the decisions for them without involving them too much in the process, <laughs> uh, which obviously is quite antithetical to uh, all the UC and design thinking methods we are applying here. Uh, on the other hand, it sort of begs the question whether there are limits to to user participation, or at least to uh, what is perceived as participation, or the the outcome, or the summary, or whatever com comes up through the whole process, and how would you make it, how would you convince the, the, the elected officials or unelected officials that think that, um, you know, participation is actually a bit of a myth and not actually uh, something they should strive for? And I think this goes to both teams. Yeah, I was, I was wondering if that was a, a targeting specific person or, or a global question. Um, I think that is the number one challenge of every single designer in the world, trying to explain people why user-centered design matters. Um, honestly, I think that the, the best uh, way to to convince someone that user centered design works is by showing them um, things that worked and showing as well things that didn't work because user or user feedback or user needs or user research was not considered at all anyone else wants to contribute an opinion Maybe are there other ways to convince uh, aside from uh, using examples that have worked or didn't work? Sorry, can or you is there a last question? Yes, Daniel. No, my connection cut. Can you just repeat the last question? Yeah, I, I was wondering. Um, I, I think Zhao is right in an extent that showing examples that work and, and don't work uh, sort of tells a story for you. Um, but then I, w I was wondering if there are any other methods that mitigate you know, a balance between uh, absolute participation and no participation at all in, in a way that would convince the, the, the most skeptics about the, the value of participation. Well, from my personal opinion, the middle ground would be um 
unattended testing or monitoring as to say use some tool like Hotjar or something like where we could actually monitor users without actually giving them tasks or employing labor to to do these things and then taking up conclusions on that the problem is that that's only possible for ongoing products and projects etc when coming up with new products such such as this uh, i don't i don't see a way out of it mm -hmm. I think perhaps this is the the greatest challenge for not only for public participation in urban planning applications. Maybe this is one of the most extreme examples where there are major interests at play and it's difficult to convince people. But but I think the way we involve users in the design process essentially is a um, is a big game of of not only this module but of the the course entirely. Um, so at this point, and uh, I'm going to leave it at this, I'd like to, to thank both groups for your uh, efforts throughout the, the last couple of months. Uh, I know for certain that Panayotis and myself have, have really enjoyed uh, observing and uh, interacting with, uh, uh, with you every, every couple of weeks and watching the, the process evolve. Um, I think, and I hope you have learned through the through the process as well, and you you find ways to implement it in your own uh, work. Um, and but 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 also, I, I think we have you have learned a lot, and we have learned a lot with you in terms of a specific problem of the of the public participation in the planning process. And uh, it's my opinion as well that uh, I think you, you all didn't have a background or an understanding of this particular problem in the past. And I, I feel by the end of the module, you all have become to a certain extent experts or very knowledgeable uh, about, about the various challenges and approaches and what's been done in this field. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you very much for your time tonight um, and we'll, uh, we'll provide feedback via the classroom interface uh, and please if you haven't filled in the peer review uh, forms uh, do so by the end of the day. Uh, otherwise, thank you all for coming. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you.